I am a musician. Um, it's the majority of my activity uh, on a, over the course of a week or a month has to do with music, but I teach at a university and I actually teach uh, business fundamentals as they, and economic fundamentals as they apply to the entertainment business at University of Georgia, Terry College. Um, and I have a background in math, computer science, and uh, oddly, uh, quantitative finance. And I've spent two stints working as kind of what's called a quant. If you don't know what a quant is, we're the people who wrecked the economy the last time. Um, and probably I'll wreck it the next time, too. Um, so I'm, I, I'm not an expert like Joel is on economics and finance, but I can kind of work my way around it a little bit and stuff like that, and that's sort of how I got there. So, um, so I'm going to speak about Napster, and Napster is a synonym, really, in the music world for three things, okay, to, to artists. It's a, it's a synonym for three things. Napster is a synonym, synonym for uh, music theft or piracy whatever you want to call it. I actually prefer to call it music theft because piracy just sounds a little cooler than it is. Uh, I think Johnny Depp and stuff like that when you get to piracy and, and stuff. So I, I just call it music theft, okay. Um, Napster is a synonym for disintermediation. Now you guys all know what disintermediation is, right? You're an MBA program, I mean. And, and uh, so, so music theft is definitely a bad thing from the artist's perspective, okay? Uh, disintermediation from the artist's perspective, uh, creatively, that was a great thing. I mean, it, it, it used to be very, you know, you didn't make a video for every th single song, you know, in the 1990s and stuff like that. But sometimes it's kind of fun to make a video for every single song and to push out a song that isn't selected as a single by gatekeepers such as the record labels or the radio stations and stuff like that. So being able to you know, push out a video of some quirky song and stuff like that, or to re release something that uh, didn't rise to the commercial threshold that, that you know, allowed us, well, basically didn't, wasn't commercial enough to justify the cost of pressing up CDs and stuff like that. This intermediation was really good creatively for artists. We could do collaborations that didn't really have to make a lot of money. They just had to sort of be worth doing and stuff like that. But financially, it kind of turns out that disintermediation ends up being not good for artists because of how artists ultimately are paid, okay? Uh, there was a period where it was good, and for certain artists it's good, but disintermediation is bad uh, overall, on average, in general, okay? Statistically, in general, for artists, okay? And then finally, Napster... I, we're, I'm going to use it as a synonym for, for re-intermediation of the music business on much worse terms to artists. And hell no, this hasn't been a good, this has not been a benefit to artists. Now, now this is going to take a little explaining what I mean by re-intermediation. Okay, so what's my next slide here? So first of all, what you should know about me uh, I, I've, I've really developed an evolution on file sharing the internet and Silicon Valley. I saw the internet as the great liberator for artists. I saw the fact that w suddenly we would be able to sell music directly to our fans, thereby capturing a much greater share of revenue. Okay? And I thought, well, wow, all this stuff that was formerly not commercially viable as music could now be viable. And that's where I started. Um, I was always sort of one of the artists that was seen sort of on what we call the copy left, like m towards more free sharing of music. Never toward for just ultimately giving it all away, but I leaned that way for a long time, right? But over the years, my experience with using the internet to sell albums and music and to promote artists, not just my own, but I have, a, I have a small record label, I work with younger artists, I work with, I produce younger artists and stuff like that. Ultimately, I've shifted my position over that fairly radically to where I think actually we've, the artists actually ended up losing in the process. There's an 11,000 word essay that I wrote called Meet the New Boss Worse Than the Old Boss that I delivered a brief version at San Francisco Music Tech Conference in February 2012. If you want to read that, I go through in great detail how artists ended up getting 
a smaller share of the revenue generated by music post Napster, okay? On average and in general. There's exceptions to the rule, but on average and in general. Um, and this was quite controversial. I was at San Francisco Music Tech, which is normally people who are very pro-internet, pro-internet helping artists and stuff like that. And I actually kind of sandbagged them. They didn't expect me to deliver a very negative critique of the technology industry in Silicon Valley towards artists. And so that was very quite controversial. And by the way, here are some of the things I've done, just so you know, I'm not uh, just a typical artist. I started out doing a lot of amateur radio. I was a truck driver. I was a newspaper pressman. And then I went to college. I became a mathematician, a programmer. Uh, I worked at an industrial farm production sort of center where I programmed computers. And uh, I also did some quant programming for the owner who was wealthy and speculated in the derivatives market. Uh, I'm a musician, then I became a professional musician, songwriter, I had my own record label, publishing company, producer. In the early 90s, I really got back into amateur radio, but now it was with networking computers over amateur radio. Uh, I had recording studios, I did a little acting, video editing suites, I did a whole bunch of jingle and custom music music supervision. I actually tried to quit the music business around 2007 and go back to quant trading because I had a friend who was very successful with that. And he was a musician also and he had hired all musicians slash mathematicians to kind of work there. And um, I had actually um, was, was spectacularly mediocre. I think I broke even, okay? And, but, but what's interesting about that time was that I started doing that just as the financial collapse happened. So it was like sort of coming out of retirement and suddenly being in the Super Bowl. So uh, very, it was very interesting. I, I also advised for private capital. capital. Um, these same guys that were doing the quant trading were also had a, like sort of a venture capital firm and they developed a lot in an incubator and they put me on the board of advisors of a company called Groupon. Camper Van Beethoven, my band, actually did the first Groupon-like thing. Um, for better or worse, we were part of that. Uh, University of Georgia, I started teaching at University of Georgia. I started, uh, I took my winnings from Groupon and started an angels investment fund in Athens, Georgia. I'm on one of the mentors on our tech incubator there in Athens, Georgia. I'm a blogger and I do a lot of public policy work. Sorry, I probably just wasted too much time with that. But I just wanted you to let you know that I do a lot of other stuff. So anyway, so the digital music paradigm, here's something that people don't understand. Uh, I always hear a lot of people say that we're trying to work out the new digital music distribution system and that one day we're going to figure it out and artists will be happy and consumers will be happy. Uh, that actually isn't true. It's remarkably stable. The digital music distribution system is here. It has three legs. It has the digital piracy, uh, file sharing, uh, BitTorrent, cyber lockers of all form, streaming, including YouTube, and then iTunes and Amazon. All three of these are this part of the same market, and they all three interact and influence each other, with piracy at the bottom being the most important negative uh, problem for artists monetizing their work, not necessarily because of it directly affecting artists. So here's my analysis that most people usually don't get if you read about me uh, in the blogosphere. Um, I've actually thought about this quite deeply. And so uh, I have three points. Piracy directly and significantly hurts artists through lost sales. I measure that quite accurately. I, I track that. I track um, BitTorrent activity. I look and see how many people like, for instance, search for Take the Skinheads Bowling, a song of mine, and then download it. Um, I don't know if all those are lost sales. I'm not claiming that, but that is the most, that is the, the root of what hurts artists in this day and age. However, it hurts artists indirectly more by applying downward pressure on revenues and royalties from legitimate services. For instance, YouTube, Spotify, and things like this have been able to pay artists quite low royalties and revenues because essentially it's almost like we, you know, it's like, well, well, actually here, slide. This is what Ockerville River said about Spotify. They said, submit or be torrented in one of their tweets. In other words, 
uh, our prices are driven down by the mere fact that it's pretty easy to illegally obtain our music, right? So that drives our prices, uh, our prices down. Uh, piracy, but what's most interesting to me is that piracy hurts artists the most by discouraging investment in music creation and in the music industry. The risks and financial burdens of making and promoting music is forced back onto artists who can least afford it. Um, and just my derivatives background, th essentially the distribution networks, those involved in distributing the music, like for instance Spotify, Pandora, uh, YouTube, and, and, uh, and the pirates themselves get a free call. And by a free call, I mean just that, like a call and a put. They basically get potential upside on every single song released without actually having to buy that call, okay? to invest in the product. And that's the fundamental thing that ultimately hurts artists. Uh, because, uh, they're streaming, submit or be torrented. Oh, and let me just demonstrate something else too. Uh, I forgot about this. With iTunes and Amazon, uh, they demanded, uh, basically Steve Jobs got a 30% free call on every song ever written by creating iTunes, right? He got, they get, iTunes takes 30% of gross. And if you're an independent artist, you have to go through an aggregator and you have to pay another 9%. So iTunes, Amazon, both charge 30% of gross uh, on the sales of all music. Their expenses are software, servers, and electricity. But just to show how uh, that, that is pr pretty much an unfair price to artists, because you know, in the old record store system charged 40% of gross, sometimes less. Um, they had to deal with shipping, storage, rent, utilities, breakage, shrinkage, which is shoplifting, and stoned employees, okay? <laughs> so it's a little hard to imagine that iTunes isn't making, it, it, it's hard to argue that iTunes is, is undercharging, okay? They're probably overcharging artists, okay? Disintermediation. Uh, Disintermediation is a blessing and a curse for artists. And I'm going to have to read this because I wrote so many things about disintermediation. Um, here's where disintermediation, Napster as disintermediation screws up artists, okay? Uh, first of all, revenues by artists and songs exhibit wild variation. Are you familiar with statistical uh, variations? There's the normal Gaussian variations and then there's wild variations. Wild variations are, you know, for instance, an album will sell 13 copies or 100 million copies, right? One album can be the majority of all of a record's record, a record label's revenue for an entire decade. For instance, Michael Jackson's Thriller was probably Sony Epic's majority of their revenue for a decade. Uh, so when you have markets that exhibit wild variation, like for instance, derivatives markets, uh, markets which exhibit such extreme variation generally develop risk-sharing mechanisms. Derivatives worlds use layers of investments, banks, hedge funds, trading firms, black box firms, and exotic forms of insurance camp contracts. What people don't understand about record labels is that they're essentially the investment banks of the music business. Record labels were our risk-sharing mechanisms. Some would say a form of socialism. Uh, essentially, superstar money redistributed to commercially unsuccessful artists and indie labels through distribution deals. A cross-subsidy exists. Most artists, the majority of all artists, do not live off of their ro royalties. The winners do, okay? But the majority of, like, the 90% of artists that are not successful actually live off of the advances they get from publishing companies and record companies, right? And so what happened with dismiss intermediation is basically that system broke down. So the winners didn't really get hurt. In fact, the winners did better. You know, people like Dave Grohl have a quarter of a billion dollars, right? He, he was a winner as this intermediation occurred, right? But, uh, you know, basically the advanced system collapsed and it turned out that selling music directly to your fans is, is not really that profitable unless you win, unless you're the lottery winner and that this whole massive infrastructure we had of bands and artists were actually dependent on advances, okay? But there was some enlightened investment going on 
uh, with the way record labels worked, and this is odd for me to say nice things about record labels since I sued two of the major record labels during my career and was blackballed by them essentially for a long period of time. Uh, these unsuccessful artists, okay, Superstar Money was redistributed to commercially unsuccessful artists and indie labels through this, these distribution deals. The small indie labels would get advances. These unsuccessful artist labels were often the R&D of the music business. They made popular trends and superstars possible. This was extremely far-sighted rational activity, which I have a hard time saying after suing two of the major record labels, but it's true. If you look at what Amit Erdogan said, he said, you know, he purportedly said, throw 10, I, I signed 10 bands, I throw 10 records against the wall, and one sticks, and that's how we make money. Uh, the vast majority of artists were commercially unsuccessful but enjoyed moderate lifestyles as a result of the system of advances. Disintermediation shifted that research and development that record labels engaged in by subsidizing all of these unsuccessful artists. They shifted that to the crowd, YouTube, Facebook, Bandcamp, SoundCloud, Hype Machine, but also highly specialized and, in, and efficient independent experts like bloggers like Pitchfork, my old Kentucky blog, and The Consequence of Sound. Oops. Uh, and finally, the re-intermediation of music uh, is uh, something I'm really fascinated with. For instance, uh, Facebook, in order to talk to my own fans that I've meticulously organized onto the Facebook page, in order to get into their news feed, I actually have to pay to promote that. Do you guys know that? Okay. Didn't used to be like that. That's something that they changed. And frankly, sometimes I find that it's valuable. There's, it's a effective for me to do this. Um, but even through the fact that iTunes, Amazon, 85% of all digital sales go through iTunes and Amazon, YouTube, Spotify, 90 or 90% of all streaming. Um, oops, Pandora should have been in there, sorry. Uh, new gatekeepers like Pitchfork, you have actually this re-intermediation of the music business where essentially you cannot really be an inter uh, independent artist without going through a large multi-billion dollar m mega corporation like Facebook or, uh, or uh, you know, uh, YouTube or Spotify. You have to use one of these gatekeepers to monetize your revenue. So we're re-intermediating the music business. The only difference is, is that most of these Silicon Valley firms are getting free calls. They don't invest back into the development of music and paying artists, right? And perversely, it's driving artists back to record labels. Hence, Radiohead did their experiment where they sold their songs to their fans and they never repeated it. Trent Reznor has returned to record labels and you see this across the board, artists returning to record labels to re-intermediation. Um, Finally, do I, do I have, am I running out of time? Do I have two seconds? Yeah, you got time. I got two, two minutes? Okay. Uh, just a, a word on piracy. I'm not naive, and the music business has always uh, dealt with unauthorized copying and piracy. I would just can characterize the pre-99 level as sort of more like this sort of organized Sicilian level of, of, of piracy. And now we have sort of this free-for-all more uh, Somalian um, uh, at sea kind of free-for-all kind of piracy. Um, so we have this, an, indus a, a, an order, uh, a degree of, a, a huge degree of, of difference, an industrial scale kind of free-for-all in piracy right now. The music business and the entertainment business can deal with lower levels of piracy, but this last version has been a little challenging. And a lot of people don't realize that free music books and films are actually highly monetized. Right here is you have this fellow called Kim.com. I don't really know very much about him, but I did figure out that that yacht belongs to a Russian billionaire. Um, the file sharing is also highly supported by um, a kit. I do know a lot about Kim.com, and you'll get to the next slide. There's a joke in it. Kim.com purportedly made $175 million in two years by charging premium, faster access for downloads through payment processors like Visa, MasterCard, Amex, American Fortune 500 companies. 
and also from advertising, the biggest online advertiser of which is Google. Um, so the file sharing is actually an enterprise level for-profit business. It's very rational. It has investors. It has uh, websites that tell you how to do this, experts who will set these things up for you. Um, it's actually, um, I'm impressed with it. As much as they take my money, I actually have grudging respect for how these things are run, right? Uh, by the way, I write a lot about Kim.com, and he writes my blog, and he addresses me as a dear copyright extremist. So I've accepted that as I'm, as I'm a copyright extremist. But uh, one thing that you really should learn about TimKim.com is that he's totally crazy. He's not really the guy thinking of all these ideas. I mean, if you read this letter, it's pretty funny. He's talking about conspiracies by hackers, that he's really a white hack data protect guy, and there's this conspiracy against him to paint him as a bad guy. What I do with him is when he writes my blog, I refuse to publish his comments, and I write him back and tell him, it's like, I'm sorry, sir, but we do not allow to anybody to post comments under a pseudonym. You'll have to give us your real name before we'll post your comments, and it drives them crazy, okay? L last thing I wanted to show you is just to show you how this works. Here's the first page of search results for Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe. Uh, there is not one legitimate link to download that song on this first page of results, except, of course, for the YouTube links, which we have to argue over whether that's really legitimate or not. So, for instance, on this search for download Carly Rae Jepsen, call me maybe. Um, every single one of those transactions is monetized by Google or attempted to be monetized by Google. If you click through onto these links, what you get is you see a double click serving an ad for the no birth control pills, no hormones on this site called Hulkshare, right? So this is actually a total commercial endeavor. It's really it's similar to the 1950s music business. My mother-in-law worked at worked for Sam Phillips at Sun Records, and my father-in-law was a car dealer. How do you think they met? Well, you know, in the in the 1950s, an artist would have a hit, and they'd want some money, and you know, Sam Phillips would send Edie Vigo over to see Frank Vigo at the you know the Ford. Uh, the GM place and buy the artist a Cadillac, you know, and everybody complained about this because basically the Cadillac was much worth much less than the royalties that the artists were showed. So, so with this industrial scale commercial ad supported piracy, we have the 1950s music business. It's just we don't actually get the Cadillac anymore. So, that's my take on it. So, I'd like to hand it over to Joel now. Okay, I need the clicker. Thank you. We agree about a lot, but not, not everything. So this is going to be fun. <laughs> wow, I really can't see that at all. OK, so uh, first off, I, uh, good news since Napster. I'm not going to make the claim that, uh, that Napster is good, but a couple of preliminaries. Uh, or is Napster not in and of itself? First of all, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of my so-called opponent here. Uh, I'm a very grudging rater of songs in my iTunes music library. I don't give five stars out very often. but. David has a five-star song in my library, so that's, that's pretty, I mean, anyway, so I'm a big fan. <laughs> it's on that album, Kerosene Hat. Okay, now I'm also not a fan of Napster per se. I mean, I consider taking things without paying to be, you know, uh, stealing. So I agree, I agree with that. I'm not a copy leftist. Uh, so here's something we clearly agree about. If you look at, like, music industry revenue, this is U.S. shipments of recorded music, and uh, it reaches a peak in 1999, which is the year that Napster occurs, and it begins declining, and it has continued to decline since then. And even when you add digital back in, it is off. There's no question that it's off. Well, I should say, I think there's no question that it's off. I mean, academics looked at this and sort of started a big fight, uh, which I would characterize as a, as a kerfuffle about whether stealing undermines the ability of firms selling things to generate revenue. And now, to be fair, it is surprisingly difficult to answer this question to a level of academic rigor, because after all, things that are popular to steal are also popular to buy, so that kind of looks to some as though stealing stimulates sales. But, you know, that's probably not right, and I think the dust has settled, and I think most reasonable people believe that stealing makes it harder for people who sell things to make money. Ooh, academics. So, um, that raises a real concern, 
right? So, uh, and, and this is a point again where David and I agree, you know, there's investment and the music industry generally, you know, they say, look, we're a high investment business. It costs a lot of money to bring stuff to market. If we're not going to get revenue, then there's going to be a problem, right? So there are these quotes from the IFPI, which is the International Umbrella Organization of the Recording Industry Association of America, a quote from Warner Music. They're just saying, look, it's expensive to bring stuff to market. And the way I interpret this is that there's this threat that if they can't generate revenue, then we'll find ourselves living in an audio stone age. No new music. I mean, that's the real concern in some sense. I mean, we're not, to give away some of where I want to end up, you know, our concern as a society is not the revenue of the recording industry. You know, our concern as the people who have a copyright system is whether good creative stuff gets brought forth and, and needs get served. Okay. And, and needs include both seller and buyer needs, but we want to think about all those folks together. The, so the epiphany that I had not too long ago was that all this research on whether stealing made it harder to sell stuff while interesting was really the wrong question. I mean, the right question is, will the flow of high quality products continue? That's really what we care about. So. Um, File sharing, the Napster thing in and of itself is of course an important thing that happened in 1999, but it's, it's really part of a set of technological changes that have affected not only the ability to generate revenue, you could call the demand side of the recording industry, but also the supply side. You, I, I think it's accurate to say we're living through a compound experiment. It's not just what happens when we can't charge money for stuff, but also uh, what happens when the costs of bringing things to market have potentially gotten smaller. I mean, certainly pr production, uh, uh, distribution are, are cheaper than they were before. Promotion, we could fight about a little bit, and I want to talk about that later. But if that's all true, then even if one concedes that it's harder to generate revenue, maybe weaker IP protection, in effect, is enough to generate the same level of incentives for creating stuff as before. So that, that's a question. Now, that's not an answer. That's just a question. It, it, it suggests the following underlying question, which is what has happened, and in distancing quotes, I'll put quality, but what has happened to the quality of new products since Napster? And uh, in a lot of areas of public policy, uh, there really isn't much in the way of evidence. Uh, it, my, my favorite aspect of this is there's this new thing called evidence-based medicine, and you sort of wonder, what the hell were they doing before? But I mean, I'd like to contribute to evidence-based public policy on the question uh, of intellectual property. And we're moving toward, uh, I think, a set of questions, a set of public policy decisions about what to do about copyright policy. Should we hang pirates? What should we do? And, and so that, we need some evidence to think that through. It's a hard problem, though, this question of, well, what's happened to the, the quality of products? It's a very hard product. And, and even take out the word quality, which is super loaded and aesthetic. Just think about the appeal or the service flow of the new stuff. It's a hard question. I mean, one thing, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, are there more or fewer new products than before? And you'll see there are a lot more, but, but in some sense, who cares? Because most of them never get viewed, listened to by anyone. So that doesn't answer the question whether there's more service flow being delivered by new products. Uh, what I try to do to get around it, so I mean, here I have to, you know, I've decided this is the right question, so you have to give me some leeway to try to answer it any way I can. Uh, so I have a couple of ways I'm going to try to go about answering it. One is, to, uh, to look at what critics say. And you know, critics make these best of lists, and if you have enough of these best of lists, you can see whether there are lots of these things that made the list from recent periods versus earlier periods. Another way to go about it is to look at actual purchase, you know, consumption of music by time and vintage, and I'll go into lots of detail about this in a minute. But, so I have two broad ways of, of going about this, and I'll talk a little bit about them. So the, the first approach, what I want is I want an index of the number of works that surpass some constant threshold of quality over all time, okay, where all time means back to 1960. I think that's when the world began, more or less. And so I'm going to use these, these retrospective best of lists. All right? So it's not like every year there's a 10 best list. So it's not that, because there's always 10. So th that's not what it is. It's these like best of the decade, best of all time. If you have a lot of such lists and you trust the critics, then you could take those lists and turn them into indices and figure out whether, well, according to these indices, are, are, are the number of works kind of surpassing the threshold rising or falling over time. So one very famous such list is Rolling Stone's 500 best albums of all time. If you take that list and turn it into an index, again, where an index is associated with the, the year that the number of albums that came out in each of the years, okay? Now, one thing you see is that, uh, you know, the Rolling Stone folks, and given their vintage, maybe it's not surprising, but they think the best music ever came out in 1970, and things have been pretty much downhill since then. But uh, in any event, I, I found lots of such lists. This is a slide you, or a picture you can't quite see, but what it is, it's a, 
time is on the horizontal axis, and the number of different best of lists goes up vertically. I've found lots of these different best of lists, especially for the period since 2000. But what, if I can statistically splice those lists together, the indices associated with those lists, then I can come up with an index of what's happening to the, well, the quantity of high quality music. So here's what I do. I, I have lots of such lists. More than, uh, about five of them go back to 1960. Lots of them cover the recent period. You see that the, the, the period b before 2000, which by the way I've covered with a little modesty barrier, uh, you know, it rises, reaches a peak about 1970, it's falling, rising again in the 90s, falling toward the end of the 90s. Then we have Napster, and the list goes flat. Now again, I don't want, I don't, that sounds like that sentence means I'm implying Napster caused it to go flat. That's not what I'm saying. What we've heard in general, not so much from David, but from a lot of folks is Napster was the beginning of the end of the world. And so we should expect bad things to happen after Napster if it's in fact the end of the world. And it doesn't look like the end of the world. You know, it's flat. Maybe you could say it's flatlining. If you wanted to be kind of, uh, I don't know, optimistic, you could say, well, relative to the decline being experienced before, it's turned. But in any event, it's not falling. It doesn't look like the end of the world. Now, there are a lot of things not to like about this critic-based stuff. I mean, uh, even though you could say, well, it stands in pretty stark contrast with the assertion that the sky is falling, but you know, the few albums that make the best of all time list or best of the decade list from a particular year, that's the very right tale of the distribution. There are tens of thousands of uh, pieces of music released each year. And we don't really know if this is, uh, speaks to what people in general care about. So there's a lot of reasons to, to, to not very much like what I just did, even though I just did it. Um, so let's go to another approach that's based, instead of on elite opinions, based on the consumption decisions of actual human beings. So the second approach is to try to measure, you know, again, quality. But think about, whenever I say the word quality, just think about service flow or appeal or whatever it is that causes people to buy stuff. So I want to measure the, uh, the, the, the quality of music from different vintages based on actual service flow and consumer decisions. So the idea is really kind of simple. If one vintage's music is better than another's, its greater appeal should generate higher sales or greater airplay uh, through time after accounting for depreciation. That last part's really important. There's depreciation in this business. Older stuff is less, less valuable to people. It's less consumed on average. If you just look at any point in time, and I'll show you the data in a second, at any point in time, people are uh, using new stuff more than they're using old stuff. But after you account for that depreciation, are there some vintages or sets of vintages that seem to be kind of generating more service flow than others? That's the, that's the approach. Here's a little bit of data. So I have two uh, little bits of data. I have some airplay data for, f I guess, five years, 2004 to 2008. Uh, what I have is the share of spins on the radio for music in that calendar year originally released in each previous year. Okay, so I can do uh, vintage by time for five years, and I can go vintages back to way back. And it's based on very large numbers of spins, millions. So these are good estimates of the shares for each earlier vintage. Now in sales data, I have the Recording Industry Association of America certification. So when an album hits half a million, that's go or gold rather, I know half a million were sold. I know when it was released, when it hits half a million. I know when it hits a million, that's platinum. When it hits two million, you know, double platinum and so forth. That, the, the certified sales are a small share of albums released, but a large share of sales. They're about half, two thirds, something like that. So it's not the perfect data. By the way, the perfect data, I got a price quote on the perfect data from Nielsen. They wanted $1 million for it. So I don't have it. Uh, anyways, um, <laughs> the research budget is generous here, but not quite that generous. So th these pictures just show uh, that older music sells and is aired less. Uh, less. The, the left hand side is the, the sales data now binned by uh, the years. So, so basically the, the first column says that a large, or the first bar rather, shows that a large share, I guess it's about 40% of music sold this year was released this year, and then it kind of declines going back. You see the same idea in the right hand side picture based on airplay, but that's in terms of calendar years rather than uh, number of years since now. So that's just, there is depreciation, so maybe that's not surprising. Back to my question though, the thing in red, after accounting for the music age, are some vintages sold or aired more or less? And so uh, I do a bunch of stuff and I, I, I what, you know, we can talk about what I do. Let me do a geek, a uh, couple of words here. So I take the share in year T, the share of music either sold or aired on the radio that was originally released in each preceding vintage. I take the natural logarithm of that and run a regression of that on a series of 
dummies for age, the year since release. That still allows me then to identify the effects of all the vintages. And what I get back then is the vintage, this, this picture is a picture of the vintage effects, or what I would call um, the, kind of the variation in vintage quality over time implied by this method. But all you have to think about to think about it is to say, after accounting for the age of music, is some of it being purchased or aired more or less than others? And what you see in the picture is based on the airplay data, Kind of interestingly, much like the Rolling Stone, it rises to 1970 and then falls. There's a little, of a, bump, a little bit of a bump up in the 90s, but not much. It's pretty clear this period between 80 and 2000 is considered a drought by this method, although notwithstanding your work. Um, and then what happens? Any guesses? Well, it rises, you know, rather substantially. I mean, to a level not seen since the Doobie Brothers were active. So, uh, and, and, you know, and this is based on actual, con you know, well, this is not consumption, it's airplay, but it's a decision about which music to use. Now, how about the consumption data? So here, because the certifications are, it's sort of coarse data, it's not the actual sales of each piece of music, which I wish I had but cannot afford, but nevertheless, you see a pretty similar thing in what comes out of these data. It peaks in 1970, it comes down, and then, well, the suspense is killing me, it rises after 2000. Okay, so it looks like with these two methods, which I prefer not because of the results, but because they're based on behavior and not the views of elites, it looks like recent stuff is generating high service flow compared to stuff released before the technological changes, including Napster. Now, uh, uh, maybe this is obvious now, but you know, there's no evidence in my view that the vintage quality has declined. There's better evidence that it's actually increased. Now, it is hard to know what otherwise might have been, right? You could say that and remember, the underlying issue here is what we agree, there was bad news on the demand side. I'm saying there's good news on the supply side. Maybe if there'd only been good news on the supply side, we'd be living in a super golden age instead of just a golden age. But, uh, and, and I, so I can't rule that out. But nevertheless, compared to the perspective that, you know, we've gone to hell in a handbasket, it just doesn't look like that in these data. We're better than we were since, you know, the mid-70s. But that does raise a puzzle. You know, why is this so-called quality or service flow, why is it up despite the reduction in revenue. You know, I said, well, supply is up, but even that's kind of an incomplete story. So I want to talk a little bit about, about that. How much time have I got? Okay, that's great. So it's some fundamental features of recorded music. And here again, we agree completely. This is a so-called nobody knows industry. This is this famous quote from William Goldman about movies. Nobody knows nothing. Nobody knows which of the products you release is going to be successful. And so in these is industries, books, movies, music, maybe 10% of products cover their costs with revenue and the rest are failures. Uh, so it's hard to predict success. Now, traditionally, it has been very expensive to, to uh, I use the word experiment, uh, that means to find out whether it's going to have appeal to consumers. And really, you have to bring it to market, and that's expensive. You've got to bring it to market to find out if it's a success. Now, the IFPI, as recently as a year or so ago, is saying, for us to bring a new album to market costs $1 million. I don't think they're lying. I mean, the traditional way of doing this with, a, you know, you have a studio, you have videos, you, you pay to get it on the radio in various ways, a $1 million. And so what the traditional labels do is they choose a relatively small number of artists to bet on, and they bet on those, and most of them fail. Not because, you know, the labels are bad at it, it's just a hard problem. And so that means, think about, you know, how we get the quality that we've had traditionally. Well, we luckily get 10% of a small number that turns out to be good. Now, along comes digitization, and of course, again, there's the bad news on the demand side, but on the supply side, it's very clear that production has become cheaper, uh, at least many aspects of it. It's clear distribution is cheaper, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about promotion. It looks a lot like that's cheaper, too. If all that is true, then that means it's become cheaper to experiment. That is, for society to take a draw from the urn and find out whether it's something good, and if somebody figures out that it's good, we're all going to figure out that it's good. And if that's true, we're going to end up with lots more good stuff. So that's my possible explanation, although it's all at this point just uh, speculation until we get to some data. So if this is true, a bunch of things ought to be true. There ought to be a bunch of new products. And when I even, more than just new products, but new products that come somehow meaningfully to market. They get a hearing with consumers. Uh, and it should include things that used to not make it out. So things that used to have too little ex ante promise to get promotion. And I'm going to think about that as stuff on indie labels. Uh, that's going to be the way I, I study that. It ought to be true that there's a changed information promotion environment. You know, so it used to be radio, terrestrial radio, and that was clearly always a bottleneck because not very many songs made it on the radio, and that's why there were incentives to bribe and so forth. Uh, are there new ways to learn about music? Can I show you some information about that? 
Are there changed paths to commercial success? If you look at the stuff that does end up being commercially successful, uh, what are the changing roles of traditional radio, of internet promotion, of internet criticism? And then finally, I think the, maybe the most important one is, do the products with less ex-ante promise, that is their promise at the time the investment decision is being made, do those end up accounting for a growing and large share of what turns out now to be commercially successful? That's what I want to talk about for a couple minutes. So um, I, I have this anecdote about the Arcade Fire Suburbs album, which in some sense illustrates all of this. You know, this is on you know, the indie Merge Records label, very cr critically acclaimed, a very high meta score, very little conventional airplay. You couldn't even see them on the Billboard airplay chart. Uh, but they're big on internet radio. There's a the Last FM. They got a lot of spins at Last FM. I realized some of which were scrabbles, but many were actual spins. Sold more than a half a million copies. It was gold, it was, and it was actually the best album of the year, best album Grammy. So it's an example of you know, uh, not using the traditional kind of uh, methods of promotion and, and so forth and actually achieving pretty big success. But how about systematic data? So more new products, that's clearly true. Uh, 30,000 new products in the Nielsen data set in 2000, 100,000 new products in 2010. So lots of growth in products. But again, by itself, that means nothing since most of them, uh, you know, not even mom listened. Now, how about the changing information environment? Um, so traditional airplay, there are data that I wish I had. I wish I had the full kind of broadcast data systems uh, listings. Instead, I have Billboard's top 75 songs of the week. That's 3,900 3, listings per year uh, of songs. If you look at that, there are 300 distinct artists on that list in typical years. Now, I can compare that with internet radio, and here I, I wish I had Pandora data, but nobody seems to have Pandora data. I do have Last FM data. Last FM lists their top 420 songs of the week. I don't know where they come up with these numbers. But if you look at the overlap between those two lists, the Billboard heavily promoted on radio stuff and the Last FM stuff, there's very little overlap. And if you look at the lists, it's sort of, it's sort of great. They know the left-hand side is very kind of conventional, mainstream, the stuff they play on uh, satellite radio 20 on 20, the soundtrack of hell. Uh, and the stuff on the right-hand side is hipster stuff except the Beatles, but it's much different. The point here being that internet radio and other things like it seem to allow promotion for things that are, let's say, less promoted, uh, were less promoted on traditional radio. There's also a big growth in online criticism, Pitchfork being one of the major ones. This is just a, a, a graph of the, of the number of reviews at Metacritic according to which source they're from and which, when that source was founded. You just see a big acceleration in the growth of online criticism, you know, before the internet, but certainly in the internet era. Uh, and a lot of this is information that allows people to, to make choices about what to potentially buy. All right, success and promotional channels. What's happening to the roles of traditional airplay among successful artists and the role of critics? And it, so here is the share of, and I can't even read my own slide, but this is the share of, uh, of artists uh, with airplay and the Billboard, uh, the Billboard airplay uh, data. Um, yeah, no, sorry, it's the share of the commercially successful albums that had a bunch of airplay. And what you see is that it's declining. All right, it's declining uh, you know, since 1990, but the this decline has accelerated since about 2000. All right, so airplay seems to be playing a smaller role in the promotion. You know, on the other hand, if you look at the share of these Billboard successful, so the Billboard 200 is the weekly list of the, most, uh, of the biggest selling albums. You see a growing share that are being uh, discussed in Metacritic or reviewed at Metacritic. Now, part of that's mechanical because Metacritic's growing over this period from not existing to then covering 1,000 albums a year by the end. But it certainly does suggest a, a different pathways to commercial success. Now, finally, and I, I got to stop in a minute, um, do artists with less ex ante promise, who would not have made it to market, or at least not in a meaningful way, prior to digitization, now achieve sales success? And do indies account for a growing share of sales? And the answer, you know, briefly is yes. If you look at the left hand side bar chart, that's the share of the Billboard 200 who are on, uh, on indie labels, and it goes from my about uh, 13 to about 40% or 30% over this period. So it's like a triple, triples more or less. And even if you look at the very top end of the Billboard 200, the top 25 week by week over this period, it's tripling from 6 to about 18%. So that's a bit of a transformation. Now, uh, so what would I say? I would say digital disintermediation provides a possible explanation for this increased quality or service flow that I'm, uh, that I'm documenting. And given the unpredictability of these products at the time of uh, uh, of investment, more experimentation is going to lead to the discovery of more so-called good music. 
a lot of which would not have come to market before digitization. So uh, I think I can skip the general lessons and put up my changing face of digitization slide, which is, you know, this is what we were obsessed about a while ago, and it's still a problem. We don't disagree about that at all. But I think there's another element that makes digitization <laughs> look a bit more like that. Okay. Excellent. Well, uh, let me start by saying that I love this study. Okay, I'm actually a fan of, of this study because it does a lot of things that, I mean, it, 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 it highlights something that I have always agreed with, despite the fact that artists are getting a lot less money and, and, and um, you know, having a more difficult time making records. And I see when people tour, they're sleeping on couches more and touring less. And just, there's just sort of a general lower level of sort of subsistence in that great middle class of musicians. As a musician and a fan of music, it's, it's like I'm in a candy store for the last 15 years. I mean, really, there's all this music that I see that I would have never found before and, and, and great innovation. And, um, and, and, and I see people who would have never had a, 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 a chance in hell of ever making it. A good example is Alabama Shakes right now, I think is an excellent sample, example of ever making it, ever being... Uh, you know, promoted by the traditional old music business, like making it, right? So I love this study, and from a consumer point of view, I, I say, well, this, this, is, this is actually, actually uh, you know, this is great, you know. From a consumer point of view, what do I do? I listen to Spotify, I watch music on YouTube. All of these things I just cr criticize as a consumer, I understand them and I enjoy them, okay? And, I would say, I would agree with Joel here in that, that that bump in, let's just call it quality right now, although I won't, I, I argue that it's not actually quality, um, but that bump in sort of appeal um, of newer music post Napster has a lot to do with the fact that the, the old system nobody knows nothing when they're making an album remember you had to you had to sign an artist that people had only seen in a small little region and then bring their product to the marketplace without really any sort of you know basically beta testing right and and now you know essentially the music industry can look at artists that kind of have developed quite have been basically beta tested really, really well. And so the music industry, independent or major label or just some rich guy who wants to put some money into a band can apply their capital much, much more effectively. And so for that reason, you get better music, okay? The question, or you get the same sort of quality of music that you did before by paying artists less. My only take on all of this is, is, that, is, is that exactly fair? I mean, we, we have come such a long way in, in, like in the last 20 years especially, like towards um, thinking about how every participant in the global economy needs to be treated fairly, how every ethnicity, every, um, you know, how, 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 look, look, look at how gay rights have advanced. Look about how when you go to Starbucks, they're proud to sell fair trade coffee whereby those who grew the coffee were paid fairly. So I don't actually disagree with any of this. My, my take on this is that, well, you know, to me, we are getting, we're trying to be a kinder and kinder society, and we still should actually keep in mind that there are many artists who don't. Uh, who, who, who basically provide all of these great services to us and no longer make a living. You know, the bottom kind of fell out of the middle class in the music business, as it did in a lot of the economy, okay? Not just musicians. But I, I, that's my point. And then my one criticism of Joel's study that I would like to see him do is I would like to see him put live revenues 
into the equation. Because I think when you get to live revenues, that might be a better measure of long-term quality. And I don't know, it still might agree with his study. But I wonder, you know, people pay a lot of money for those vintage artists from the early 90s and the artists from 68, 72-ish or something like that, if they're still out there touring. Um, and I, my, my only criticism is that I would like to see that happen and, you know, maybe I should do that, you know, take a study and try to put the live, uh, you know, the live numbers onto it. But um, that, that's kind of my small rebuttal to that. Consumers, yay, <laughs> okay? As a consumer, yay. As an artist, uh, there's some yes and, and in there, you know, the, dis the fact that I am creatively more liberated by Napster type systems is great. But financially, I'm, I'm disturbed by this concentration of this re-intermediation that I see occurring and, and then lack of money. So, so I mean, let me, let, me, uh, let me agree with you and, and offer sort of a, um, I mean, somewhat, so when, when piracy started, my first reaction was, because as I'm old enough to be on the side of the divide that thought it was stealing, I was actually, my biggest concern was that now there's not going to be any more music for me. Because I actually buy CDs and so forth. And so I thought, oh no, you know, these young people are ruining it for me. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I mean, I guess the, the ability to generate revenue from producing stuff uh, would have to be good. It would actually be good for even for, you know, what I'm saying. The only thing that, um, you know, the, the first few years of industry response to all of this was, seems sort of nostalgic. You know, let's, can we go back, can't we just go back to the old way? And this is not you, but this right. is sort of, you know, the big media guys were saying, you know, let's just, let's try to squelch this technological change. Let's and not make digital saying, offerings. People saying, can we just not release our music? Can we make it so our music is not digitally available? <laughs> yeah, I right, mean, people right. really were, were saying yeah. that. It's like, right. I'm going to right. take it off. Yes. And, <laughs> and so there was this sort of wish to go back. And now I, I think nobody thinks we should go back anymore. A question is, suppose we could actually control piracy and harness all the other good stuff that's happened. You know, maybe things could be even better. And I don't think there are copy leftists who say that, uh, charging prices, positive prices for zero marginal cost things is wrong, but that's obviously crazy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, don't I think know what economic school that teaches that. So <laughs> well, no, it's mostly law schools that teach okay. that. Okay, uh, it's not not mostly <laughs> economic schools. But I mean, th so the you know the the debate, or at least the kind of the policy debate about what to do about piracy isn't over. The it, the question is if if there's a way to charge money for stuff and come up with creative ways to price that don't make it so appealing to steal then uh, you know then maybe we could actually get the, the best of both worlds and uh, have better news on the supply side and better d news on the demand side my, but my, my point on that better come up with ways not you know so it's easier than stealing my point on that with the capital and that's why a lot of people think that i'm i, I get mad about this because i go god dang it i spelled it out i'm i put it in order it's piracy then the downward pressure on prices is a bigger problem. And then the accumulation of capital and investment, that's actually the biggest problem. That's why it took us basically 13 years to bring Spotify to this country. It's because there's sort of, there's, you have a marketplace where it's so crazy that people don't want to invest capital into it, is, is my point. I, I look at sports during the same time period, and I know sports enjoys all these subsidies and it's not the same as music, but sport, professional sporting and, and the revenues from that I, I have at least doubled. I was trying to find figures on it, and some people say it quadrupled and stuff in the same period, and there's been all this massive investment in that form of entertainment, where you have the exact opposite in music. So, and I have a, actually a really simple solution that it involves no government control, is I would just like to make the advertising industry sign up and say, okay, we won't put advertising on these sites because these, these um, largely Eastern European groups that are you know, managing these sites, they're all doing it for one reason, is because to aggregate page views and to get the, the advertising from that. And they'll go on to doing other things if they don't get that revenue. And it'd be interesting to just push that down 
and see what happens before anybody does anything else. Before we go back to a SOPA or a PIPA or a state action or TPP trade protocols or anything like that, it'd be interesting to see what happened is if you just took the advertising off of those sites, if that's enough, if that's enough of a nudge to push people towards legitimate services. And by the way, uh, from my view of piracy, our country isn't really the main problem. It's everywhere else in the world where you have the much bigger problem. We're subsidizing the music of business for consumers in Malaysia and India and stuff like that, essentially. I just want to say one other thing, which is that uh, in the first couple of years of all this, you know, I, I had purely this kind of armchair academic perspective because there's another industry suffering and isn't that interesting. Uh, you know, now this digitization issue has come to our business, the academic business. So uh, uh, it's not so clear that maybe I'll be more sympathetic to your claims about fairness in a few years. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I have to teach how many students? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> At the same price. Thank you both. Uh, There's a lot of information that was presented on both sides, and I agree with both of you on both your viewpoints on several things. Um, Joel, when you were talking about the quality issue, and I assume you were talking about quality in terms of money that was spent on the records, I'm wondering how much of that is a function of actual quality of music and how much is a function of demographics in terms of population. Um, I know during that time in the 1960s and 70s, there was a large baby boom population and they had there were just more consumers spending money on music. And I see that boom later in the 2000s, and I wonder how much of that is like, you know, the, the next baby boom, you know, with like a bulge in population. And I'm wondering Go if you could- my slides, I have a slide. Is it possible? I wonder if you have any comments on that at all. Uh, I'll show you the yeah, sure. The per capita yeah. consumption. Well, so uh, it's, a, it's a, one of the things I didn't spend a lot of time on is on what I literally do, but th this is a, so, Certainly the, the critic stuff, the retrospective critic stuff, could be affected. Suppose all the critics were people who reached age 18 in 1970. But my, you know, my, what I'm doing is in the, in the uh, sales and airplay based stuff, is I'm not looking at the level of sales, but the share of sales from each calendar year that come from each preceding vintage. And in the stuff based on actual sales data, I have 40 years of sales data. So it's not all about the preferences of people making consumption decisions at one point in time. So I think, although that is a potential criticism of some of the things I do, it's not a potential criticism of one of the, at least one of the approaches I use. So I don't think that explains it, but it is a legit thing to worry about in my opinion. Um, what I wanted to point out just really quickly is you see the large bulge there. Um, that's, that's actually the baby boomers replacing their vinyl with CDs um, or their cassettes with CDs. You know, the great thing about the CD was that you didn't have to, you know, for the CD you had to have two copies, one for your cassette for your car and vinyl for your house a lot of times. Um, so that's the per capita spending in adjusted for inflation. Um, and you, you see that's the great bulge is, is probably, New consumers, young consumers, as well as baby boomers um, replacing CDs. Again, thank you both for coming here. Um, I may just not be very creative this morning, but um, it's not clear what market mechanisms we could use to make uh, a good, um, preferable to pay a non-zero quantity for right, as opposed to giving it away for free. So are we just talking about changing sort of the normative context that purchasing and pirating takes place in? Or are there really different business models that can get us out of this? <laughs> Good question. That's why, I mean, that's, that's true. That's why I say don't invest a lot in trying to change what is happening right now. I mean, I know like a lot of my friends go crazy when I say this, but but what you should do is just do just remove certain incentives first and see what happens. That's why I go for the advertising thing. It may still be that people just really don't want to pay 99 cents for a song or or 9.95 a month for you know for all you can eat Spotify service. To me, we were Joel and I were talking about this last night. One of the problems is that all music is priced the same. I, I, I don't agree that all music should be priced the same. And if we could figure out how, that would help enormously 
not pricing all music the same. I think some music is, is more like a luxury good. It, it, it requires more effort to make. I mean, if you listen to a lot of pop music today, um, it's made out of samples, either samples of other songs that were previously recorded or literally like, you know, like, oh, I, I don't need a drummer. I can just program the actual drum sounds from this 1967 Slingerland kit that was paid, played by Keith Moon and I can just have that sound. Do you, do, you, do you know what I mean? But other music wants a different kind of sound stage and so pricing everything the same, geez, I wish I could, I wish we could put the toothpaste back in that tube, yes. You know, what I would say is uh, I, I don't, you know, everybody has some optimism that the, there, there was a generation that, that grew of age when piracy was feasible and thinks, you know, and they're going to have to age out of that, but maybe the next generation won't grow of age there because iTunes already existed, and maybe norms will change. But, and that's possible. I mean, I was, I'm more hoping for some technological solution that just makes it harder to steal. I mean, it doesn't have to be impossible to steal for people to steal less. It just has to be, I think it has to seem illegitimate oh and be a little harder. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that does have a big impact on what you can charge for stuff. So it's not, uh, it, it would be beneficial. But I mean, that then bumps up into against all kinds of legal issues that I, I can't really speak about intelligently. But I think there are certainly people trying to come up with technological solutions all the time. And so if we were to implement something, uh, as long as the way it were implemented didn't allow uh, the firms to be nostalgic and kind of backward moving, but I don't think it's possible to even to do that. I think all the forces have been unleashed on the supply side. So, to, you know, uh, patching up the demand side, I don't think would turn us back. I think it would allow us to move forward. There's some really interesting proposals, which are essentially sort of an ISP sort of tax on content that in some ways would seriously be a much more efficient way of collecting the revenues you know, you know what I mean? Like a, basically there's sort of be a tax. I, my problem is, is after having done some pub public policy stuff in Washington, D.C., I cannot see that happening in this country. Maybe it happens in like Canada or England or something like that. And after a while, the United States goes, you know, what, that's the fairest way to deal with it. Let's just, let's do this. Um, but, man, <laughs> it's not going to happen in, the, in Washington, D.C. anytime soon. And the cold version of me would say, we, although it's terrible that artists are making less money, you know, we still are getting stuff, so it's sad, but it's fine. Right. But, I, but I think, all things equal, it's better to be able to charge for stuff. Markets work better when you can charge for stuff. Yeah. So. <laughs> the, the other thing is too, I, I'm a, I'm, me, I have a little group of friends that we do this blog, and we're all very pro-market artists and that's one of the things that brought us together and you think about you know when you think about artists and movie actors and stuff you're always thinking of people kind of really liberal on the left and we have all sort of somehow evolved to this place where we go we look at what the free mark look at what free cultural markets gave us i mean you know you could compare like okay so so yes we get the justin biebers yes we get uh, the, the, you know, we get the Kenny Chesneys and stuff like that, but, but we got Captain Beefheart and we got, you know, Art Brute. Yes, we got Blink-182. We got all of this amazing stuff from a, a, an amazing, uh, you know, sort of free market incentive-based cultural system. And when you look at movies, it's even more pronounced. Like some, you can actually measure this. A lot of countries in the world subsidize their movie industries. But if you look at the AF, American Film Institute's top 100 films, is there one non-market based movie in that? I don't know that. I'm just asking, is there one? A few. There's a few, <laughs> a few, but like if, so I freak out that about sharing is that, <laughs> Uh, about online sharing of cultural goods, less because of the unfairness, but I just go, socialism. This is socialism. This is, this is going to be bad. When has m a total flat sharing of wealth and good ever actually... We, we've, there, we've seen this. It doesn't ever end good, right? It, 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 it ends badly, you know? That's why, has anybody ever read Jaron Lanier's book, You Are Not a Gadget? 
uh, Jaron Lanier is, is a fascinating guy because he's like the guy who coined the phrase virtual reality. I think he invented Google's Glass and now has kind of gone on this campaign against it. But he wrote, you are not a gadget. But he specific, this is a guy with dreadlocks that plays some kind of weird new agey uh, uh, form of like hippie kind of music that is a genius electrical engineer programmer, um, not probably about my age or whatever, who has lately written these amazing treatises going, hey, I, I think we're doing like Cambodian style socialism on the internet again, and I don't think that's a good idea, basically. Uh, it's pretty startling books if you, if you read his books. He also talks about octopuses a lot, so. Um, there's this, there's this trend lately in really smart people write, writing books that wander really far off topic, like Nassim Taleb and stuff like that. We'll talk about peaches for a chapter. But anyway, but he's another one of those guys, but it's a great book. You are not a gadget. Thank you both for coming and presenting today. Um, prior to me asking my question, I wanted to give some points of clarification to, you know, to also address your slides so you can see where, where my question is going. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the music industry, uh, that the artists are going more uh, back to the labels. But the labels, especially during uh, Sam Phillips' time with Sun Records, was much more regionalized. So you had these labels that just really addressed these regions and you had fragmentation that was in the music industry. And then the industry started to consolidate because they figured that, hey, it's more money. But while they were consolidating and when they were regionalized, they were also taking the royalties or the rights to intellectual property of these artists. So the artist really wasn't making uh, the residuals or making the money. That's why you have a lot of artists that are starving. Um, and but, but, uh, I'm sorry, go, let me let you finish oh, no, the question. Did you? Uh, um, uh, they were pretty bad in the 50s. They began to get better in the 60s. What ended up happening was you kind of have two really kind of golden periods for artists and artist rights. Um, and it has to do with unionization. I mean, basically all those contracts that were signed in the late 80s and early 90s, you know, that were basically, uh, you know, American Federation of Musicians, um, you know, forced a lot of things into these clauses, audit clauses, uh, that royalties had to be considered uh, even if an artist was unrecouped, record labels had to pay union dues on those things, so artists qualified for, um, uh, you know, like uh, health insurance and life insurance and stuff like that. What you most, the problem is, is that what you hear, you don't hear, the, it's, the, it's what I call the whiner bias in logic. You, you hear about the bad stories, but you don't hear about the 95% of the record deals where artists were basically fairly happy. And then you have people like uh, uh, Courtney Love drives me crazy because she made a lot of money off of her record label, but yet she, you know, and her husband's work and stuff like that, but she always complains about how terrible the record company was to her. So we have this sort of bias where we tend to think of the record labels have, uh, uh, have, uh, having a lot of, I guess, mendacity you know, like kind of being bad, you know, and in actuality there were bad players, just like there's bad players in every industry and stuff like that. But generally the 50s were bad. I will agree with you in the 50s were bad. It was partly because the record labels were so fragmented, so regional, and there was no real union power outside of a few markets like Chicago, New York, and maybe Hollywood. Okay. So, and touching on that is, or what you were saying about Radiohead and also when Prince, they tried to get creative, where Prince handed out his CDs uh, with each concert ticket that was purchased for mm -hmm. his uh, London performance. And then Radiohead, where they said to the fan, we're gonna let you decide how much you wanna pay us. Uh -huh. uh, and you're right, they never touched on that again, but I yeah. thought that that was just so innovative and so successful. Now, since we're living in the age of digitization and we have no choice because Napster yeah. pretty much opened it up, where do you think the music industry is headed? Well, the, the music industry it will always be there and, and, and there's this notion that the music industry is not 
very innovative. And, and some of the best entrepreneurs that I know, and one of the reasons I ended up working for a private capital firm and advising at these tech funds and stuff like that is I've met a few people over the years who actually really admire the entrepreneurial uh, sort of efforts of bands, small managers, little labels and stuff like that. They regard us as natural entrepreneurs. I'm actually confident a solution exists based on who is participating in this market. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and I'm not trying to cop out, but I think ultimately you, it's, a, it's like a lot of difficult problems. They turn out not to have that silver bullet. It's the dumb problems that have the silver bullet. It's problems like this that are kind of, they, they require shifts in consumer activities, um, shifts in knowledge, general knowledge, what does the consumer know about what they're doing, and small incremental nudges. And it's, I think actually you see some of those incremental nudges back to artists being compensated better already, um, just because people are talking about it. So um, the music business will survive because there's so many participants, people feel compelled to make music, not, they don't do it because they are, are getting paid, they feel that just the mere, and even if they, just the mere, just like the derivatives markets, most derivatives contracts uh, expire worthless, but the mere probability that they might be worth something, they have a value, so people continue to make music because it may have a value. So I'm not worried about it. Isn't that weird? <laughs> After all my negativity, I'm like all the pieces, it's a classic mathematician problem. We don't actually solve problems. We just show a solution exists and we leave it to the engineers and the economists and all the other scientists to work out the problem. Um, kind of talking about the, the issue of improved quality or return of quality that Joel mentioned. I'm, I'm wondering if this is attached or connected to something that David just said. If there is kind of a strange circumstance in the music industry where artists want to make music and maybe they're, I mean, for a number of reasons they want to make music, one of them might be that the opportunity cost of their day job as a barista, I don't know, to be stereotypical. Um, maybe Maybe they just want to make music, but does that push the supply curve in a way that is creating pricing pressure that, I mean, they're not trying to make money? Um, yeah, I, I think people like me compete with, uh, can I answer that really yeah, quick? Yeah, yeah. We people, but yeah, there's a lot of um, what you see, um, uh, this is subjective, um, what you see are just as many blockbusters, less stuff in the middle and stuff out in the tail. And there are some people who think the stuff out in the tail is hurting the stuff in the middle or just that there's a lot more in the middle. So since there's only so many CDs that you can buy, it's shifted out towards the tail. Do you, do you, do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> that that, and so then when th everybody in the middle is saying, well, you know, I only made $500 off that album anyway. I'm just, the next one I'm just gonna give away, yeah. That, that, is, that is an issue, right? Um, but when you talk to individual artists, generally, generally those who are kind of the, the more, and I'm not talking about big artists, I'm talking about people who spend money making albums in studios and play professional gigs where they charge money, they all still want people to pay for their albums. The vast majority of them do. But there is, a, there is a vocal segment of them who are just like, you know what, I'm just giving it away. And that it's pushing prices down. So but I'd agree with that. Two, you know, and two, two points just building on that. W one is that, uh, so it's pretty clear there's been a huge growth in the number of products available. Now, the fact that there's competition among artists can't explain a decline in overall revenue. That still looks like stealing to me. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that's sort of interesting is there's this great growth in the number of products available. If those new products were all crap, there'd be no, uh, no change in sales concentration. It would still be very concentrated among the kinds of things that used to exist. 
what you do see is a decline in sales concentration. So for example, the Billboard 200, you know, there are 200 albums a week, so over the course of the year there are 10,400 albums listed. The number of distinct albums on the, on the list in a year was about 600 until about around the year 2000. It's increased steadily from then to about, to about 1,500 distinct albums on the year, which is a big decline in concentration, consistent with the idea that new things coming in are taking market share away from the sorts of things that used to exist. Now, they might not be baristas. They might be indie artists who are fully professional and so forth, but still, the same idea. There's lots of supply, and it's drawing demand away, I think, from uh, some other existing sorts of things. But it also, you know, if you take my quality evidence to be meaningful, what it means is that the growth in service flow from new work is being driven not by blockbusters, but by a growth in a bunch of different things that probably different people like. So it's kind of a long tail story. Uh, you can actually, uh, I think one place you actually can see that happening is in the, in the, all the subgroups of progressive metal, black metal, ambient, Swedish, death metal. I mean, there's so many different kinds of that and that's all done professionally in professional studios by people who play gigs and charge money for their tickets. Uh, that world is completely fascinating because that has exploded um, there's so many people interested in that worldwide and stuff like that. Um, but they're f kind of, they're fighting each other. <laughs> like, for, not, they, well, they are literally fighting each other in some cases. But, they, but they, there you could, if you looked at that market, I bet you, you could see those pressures, like from more product being there. Um, yeah, it's not really hurting the blockbusters, but in these weird little niche places, it's, it's, it hurts artists. I have just one final thing to say, which is that I'll give you a copy of my quality paper if you'll sign my copy of Kerosene Hat. Okay, yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.